Okay, first question. Anyone know who that is? Any, any classically educated? If I said Cassandra, ring any bells? Trojan Wars? So, um, what happened was that she, she was immortal. Cassandra was immortal. A mortal person like yours and me. And one of the gods fell in love with her. And she rebuffed him. She said, no thanks, but no thanks. And so what he did, because the gods were cruel, he gave her the gift of prophecy. She could see the future. But the gods always had a curse. Anyone want to tell me what the curse was? No one would believe her. Yeah. So it drove her mad. And this is her standing outside Troy. Because she said to them, don't bring the horse into the city. It will end badly. And they didn't, they didn't believe her. So that's Cassandra. Um, who are you guys? So, uh, how old are these people now? So who was born in, I can't do the math seriously, 1992? Anyone? Hand up if you were born in 1992. 1991? Okay. Uh, 1993. Okay. 1994? So, this stuff, this stuff that I'm currently reading about and I lived through, because I'm 44, happened before you were born. And what, what matters between 1988 and 1995, before you guys were born, or just after, is that in 1988, scientists started saying, climate change is a real problem, we have to start doing something about it now. And it then went fairly quickly through a political process, so that in 1992, a global deal at the Earth Summit, have they done Earth Summit, Rio? So in 1992, there was a global deal in Rio um, with the Biodiversity Convention, but also the Climate Change Convention. And what the world's nations agreed was that they would stabilize their emissions by the year 2000. And the developed countries, Australia, United States, United Kingdom, would take the lead in cutting emissions <coughs> to create space for the developing world to grow their economies to get out of poverty. Does anyone want to tell me how that turned out? Did the, did the developed world take its responsibility to reduce its emissions so that the developing world could grow its emissions seriously, or did they just sign a piece of paper and walk away? Sign a piece of paper and walk away. So when we talk about responsibility, for letting the developing world grow, well, we've already promised to do that, and we haven't done it. Right, no judgments. Um, so be honest, who here considers themselves and it would accept the label environmentalist? Just, I'm just curious. A couple of people. Okay. Who worries about climate change? Again, no judgments. I'm just curious to find out a few people. Okay, right, that's, that's cool. So on a scale of 1 to 10, where 10 is, by the time you're as old as me, another 22 years, we'll all be, it'll be cannibalistic murder and mayhem and hell, and, did I say that was 1 or 10? 10. And 1, thank you. And 1, where everything will be just like now, except the gadgets will be smaller and shinier, and we'll have hoverboards and holidays on the moon. How many people are 10 we're doomed? Nine, eight, put your hand up when I hit your number. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two. No hands up twice. One. Okay, that's a, that's a good one. Right, maybe two for you. Here's what I hope the takeaways are. I'm going to whip through. I'm going to give Jen these slides, I'm going to put the slides up on the website, you don't need to write anything down. So, I'm going to distinguish between hope and optimism, tell you that we're all doomed on several of these slides, and then tell you a bit about what we're doing in Manchester. Um, difference between hope and optimism is, is optimism is just a gut feeling. Hope is when you continue to do stuff even though you think it's too late, and that's where I'm at. And the mirror test, which you can't see, because it's gone off the bottom of the slide, Who's heard of Noam Chomsky? 
Noam Chomsky, a few people, great. I would highly recommend you read Noam Chomsky. And he basically says, the reason he does stuff is so that he can look in the mirror in the morning. So he's a professor at University of Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He's been active since before I was born. And um, he doesn't necessarily believe we're going to get out of this mess, but if he doesn't act, he can't look at himself in the mirror. It's later than you think. Who, who knows what IPCC stands for in this context? Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And there's a separate story about how the IPCC was set up to insulate the science from the politics, and the Americans organized it in a certain way so that they didn't get pushed around by scientists, but we're not here for that today. I was in a meeting with the Royal Society, it was a public meeting, um, and one of the lead authors is this woman called Susan Solomon, and she was one of the scientists who discovered the ozone hole. Uh, over the Antarctic, and she'd been one of the lead authors on, on this report. And people, through the course of the two-day meeting, people kept going, yeah, yeah, we understand when you tell us it's really bad, but how long have we got? And all she would say is, it's later than you think. Which struck me as a very fair answer. And the cartoon's really good too, um, I don't know if you had a chance to read it, but basically the scientist has been there since 1990, and he's beginning to wonder if his microphone is switched on or not. Um, again, that's a separate. Ah, now that's a pity. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows what the Anthropocene is? Anyone? A few people. Great, good. Okay, um, you can't see it, it's just here behind the text there. Basically, it's a name for the current period we live in. So you've heard of, you know, the Jurassic period. Oh my god, has anyone seen the trailer for <laughs> Jurassic World? <laughs> Who the hands up who's seen the trailer? <laughs> Is it, does it look like the worst movie ever made, or what? Anyway, I don't know. Um, the Anthropocene is the name given to the geological period that we are now in. And that's a startling thing, because it's a big planet that we have started to make over the last 200 years since the Malthus guy, real impacts on the planet in terms of we're living through the sixth great extinction. There have been, in the, all the course of life on Earth, not human life, but over million, billion, millions of years, 500 million years, there have been five episodes of extinction where most of the species on the planet die out. And you and I are living through the sixth, and we are causing it. Okay? And you probably can't see all of these graphs, but do you see how they all just suddenly spike upwards? Does anyone want to tell me? You are right, that's not that good, but maybe some of you can guess. Uh, what year? Because along the x-axis you've got years. What year does everything start to shoot upwards? Any takers? 1950. Why would that be? World War II. So, no one's got any money to spend because we're just trying to kill the other guy. Europe is flattened. By about 1950, the economies are on the bounce back. And what's happened during World War II is we've developed new technologies for flying, for shipping, radar, sonar, etc. And what we're then able to do is take the technologies that we developed to kill the other guy and start to intensify our exploitation of natural resources. So fishing used to be you'd go out with some nets and you'd hope to find some fish. But after World War II, there's a whole lot of surplus ships, and they've now got sonar and radar to tell where the fish are. So they've, and they've now got more powerful engines, and they've become much, much more efficient at getting the fish. Does that make sense? You've also got an expanding um, population. So I'd really recommend the Anthropocene, and when I put the um, video up um, of this, there will be better um, slides. I'll rewrite history. Pop quiz. <coughs> if there's a lily pad in a pond and it doubles in size every minute and will completely cover the pond in one hour, how long will it take to cover a quarter of the pond? Think about that for a second. Anyone want to guess? Shout out, no humiliations. Unless, I'd, I'd laugh at you, James, if you got this wrong. Right. But not at any this, this is exactly what Malthus suggested with population, yeah, 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 yeah. geometric oh, increase. Turn, turn, turn. Same, same stuff, Mark. 58 minutes. 58 minutes. 
And up until 57 minutes, you'd be thinking, everything's hunky-dory, there's loads of pond still left. That's the nature of exponential growth. Remember the previous slide. The chessboard, yeah? So the story goes that this um, clever clogs guy said to the king, uh, will you give me uh, a present? And the king says, anything you like. And uh, the, the guy says, well, I'd like a sack of wheat um, where there's a, 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 an amount where you put one bit of wheat, grain of wheat, on the first check aboard, twice as much on the second, twice as much again on the third, and so on. And the king says, yeah, sure, fine. There isn't enough wheat on the planet to cope with that to 64 checkerboards. But it looks okay in the early stages. Actually, I'll, dive, I'll come back to the Malthus thing. The key thing you have to understand is James is absolutely right. <coughs> Kills me to say. <laughs> um, the people, people have been predicting that we would run out of oil, of wood, of bauxite, and yes, when the price goes up, people get interested in finding more. Since about the 1970s, the environmental concern has not been that we would run out of resources to exploit, but that the capacity of the planet to absorb our waste products would be reached. And then after that time, we would start basically swimming in our own shit. <laughs> and that, that's the thing that we're struggling with as a species. The planet can't absorb, it's not that we can't rip it out of the ground, we can do that, we're very clever. The planet can't absorb what we're doing. Who's seen Thelma and Louise? <gasps> That's a gap in your education. Okay, I cannot recommend this film enough. It stars Susan Sarandon and Gina Davis, and it is the most cool feminist, and I mean that in a positive sense, polemic <coughs> film that Hollywood will ever make. And they are an older woman and a younger woman who are on the run from the police for reasons I won't go into. You must see this film. It came out in 1991. And these two cops are talking. You know, the one thing I can't figure out, are these girls real smart or real, real lucky? Don't matter. Brain can only get so far and luck always runs out. Species in a nutshell. <laughs> so we're really clever. We've dealt with every problem in the past, usually actually by running away. The two things that Malthus got wrong was he didn't understand how much of the planet there was left to colonise, and Britain and Ireland sloughed off population to Australia and America. He also didn't see fossil fuel exploitation coming. First coal through the 19th century, picking up at the end of the 19th century oil and gas. And those have been our energy slaves, and they've given us enormous benefits, the laptops that you've got, the clothes that we wear, the food that we eat, that all comes from fossil fuel consumption. And that's where Malthus got it wrong. The point I want to make here, and this book is excellent, Thomas Homer Dixon, there are limits to how innovative and adaptive we can be. And if you want to bring fancy new pieces of technology into the world, you need stable legal systems, which you alluded to, so that you can develop these things, patent them, not get ripped off. You need um, universities which are churning out intelligent graduates, etc., etc. And if things are falling apart, which I'm afraid they're going to start to do, or they are doing in parts of the world, ingenuity and adaptation gets harder. Um, and then every empire except the current ones collapsed. History is full of examples of empires that thought that they would last forever. In the middle of the 20th century, the Nazis thought their Reich would last a thousand years. It lasted 12, thank God. A bit too long, but never mind. Um, it can't be that bad. You guys don't believe me. You, I'm sure you don't believe me. And two of the things that are probably going through your head are, if it were as bad as he's saying, our leaders would have done something. And People have cried wolf in the past, predicted the end. Very quickly, our leaders, I'm sad to say, are no smarter than us. Okay? I don't know if you've ever 
Who here has like, talked with a Member of Parliament? Hands up. Okay. Did they strike you as Nobel Prize winners? No. They're not, just because they're wearing suit and ties, just because they're on television, doesn't mean they're any smarter than you. Something I didn't put on here as well is, they've had 25 years. Since 1988, they've been warned by climate scientists that they had to do something. And they're still not doing anything. Okay? They're not rational. None of us is rational. All of us have bad habits that are not in our long-term best interest. Terror management theory, it's a great idea. Look it up. What happened to Cassandra? I mentioned that. Almost done. People said, so, I've said to you it's all doomed. And hopefully I've convinced some of you. Anyway, um, what are we doing here in Manchester? PEST stands for People's Environmental Scrutiny Team. I don't know if any of you have ever been to uh, an environmental event, but it's a bit like what's happening here. One person stands at the front and just talks at you. And like, you sink lower and lower as your chair and you're checking your Facebook and you can't wait to get out. What we do with People's Environmental Scrutiny Team meetings is we structure it entirely differently. And when people come, we find out what skills they have and what skills they would like to have. Maybe they're really good at making videos, maybe they're good public speakers, maybe they're really good at designing websites, maybe they're really good at lobbying politicians. Or maybe they're not and they want to be. And what we do is we pair them up with people who are good at those skills. Why are we doing this? We're trying to help people develop their skills. We're trying to make Manchester more responsive because Manchester City Council's made a whole series of promises about climate change and it just hasn't kept any of them. Um, and we've got a meeting coming up, and if you're interested, um, you can get a flyer off me, and hopefully I've not been radical. In the sense that to be truly radical is to make hope possible rather than to stay convincing, and hopefully now... Do we have another Samaritans yet? Yeah? <laughs> um, have a, oh yeah, one last thing. The world's biggest coal company. Any takers? Peabody Coal. There are other companies that dig up coal as well, but those companies are diversified, like BHP and um, RTZ and Glencore. The world's biggest coal company that only does coal is called Peabody, and they have launched an advertising campaign earlier this year that replicates James's rhetoric. The advertising campaign is called Advanced Energy for Life, and what it is claiming is that the only way to lift the world out of poverty is to sell them more coal. So rather than going along that A, B, C curve, what very powerful vested interests in the West want to do is have the world go through the top of that tunneling thing, C, so that they can make more money. If they succeed in doing that, we're all doomed even quicker than I've been telling you we're doomed.